Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning service for the Lebanon Church of Christ in Dresden, Tennessee. Uh, this pre-recorded service is being made available for Sunday, uh, August 11th, 2024. And we are glad that you are here today uh, and able to join in with us online. Uh, so much going on uh, in our community right now. School is back in session. Uh, a lot of our college freshmen and uh, uh, returning students are headed back to campus uh, this past week, uh, there was move-in day at Freed Hardman yesterday. Other universities uh, are involved in that. Our student center ministries uh, are kicking back up around the area. And so we are just excited uh, for back to school. We're excited to have some of our rhythms back, uh, hopefully, and glad that you are with us today. Uh, we have some exciting things going on at Lebanon, and we want to make you aware of some of those uh, as we move through our time online today. And we'll share even more uh, in person this morning. Uh, Lord willing. If you are in our uh, Dresden area, if you're here in Weekly County uh, this morning, we would invite you to be with us at the building uh, if you're able. We'll have our Sunday school classes at 9 a.m. Our adult classes uh, in James chapter 2 this morning, uh, studying about faith and works and their relationship uh, with one another. Uh, our worship time will then be at 10 uh, a.m. and uh, we'll have a lesson that will be similar to the one uh, I'll share here online with you. Uh, and then Lord willing, tonight at 5 p.m. Uh, we will have our discussion Bible study. And we have been talking about uh, the church and how uh, some of us were raised to think uh, in certain ways about the church that may have been helpful uh, in a season, but how we have to build upon uh, the basics and go from there. And so uh, looking forward to that study, uh, Lord willing, tonight at 5 uh, p.m. We have a lot of different activities, as I said, going on in our community, uh, gospel meetings, vacation Bible schools, people trying to finish uh, all of that up uh, before the school year starts. And so uh, we'll make you aware of a couple of more opportunities uh, that are coming up in that area uh, as well. As far as our time uh, online today, uh, I'll pray here in just a moment to get us started. It's a new day. It's the first day of the week, uh, and we're glad to be able to, to begin that by calling on the Lord together and lifting up our prayers and petitions uh, to Him. Then we'll step into our lesson time, and uh, today's question, uh, we've been focusing on some detailed questions uh, that reveal a lot more about maybe who's asking them uh, than about the question uh, just on the surface would uh, itself. And today we'll be in Mark chapter 4. Uh, where the disciples are afraid, uh, and they ask Jesus, Do you not care uh, that we are perishing? Uh, Carest thou not that we perish? Is how the King James says it. And so uh, we'll look at that question, and, and does God care? And how does fear make us respond uh, to God's presence in our lives? Uh, following that, we'll take a moment to reflect, and then I'll offer a couple of prayers uh, for the Lord's Supper uh, that you can use if you're worshiping at home. Uh, we have folks dealing with sickness or taking treatments who may not need to be out. There may be others who are traveling, uh, but I'll offer those prayers for you to use uh, as you're there if you need those this morning. Then we'll have some announcements uh, that will particularly uh, pertain to our Lebanon folks, uh, and then we'll, then we'll close out with another uh, word of prayer to send us out uh, into the week. Uh, whoever you are, wherever you're from, whatever you've done, um, we're glad that you're here and uh, glad that we can share this time uh, looking at God's Word and lifting Him up uh, together. Let's go ahead and uh, begin with that prayer, and uh, then we'll step into this lesson and, and see what God's Word has to tell us about uh, how much He cares uh, ultimately for us. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this day and to come here in the, the quietness of the morning uh, or the busyness of mid-afternoon, whatever uh, season we're in, whatever finds us uh, in this place today, we give you thanks. And we give you thanks for the blessings that we have, uh, for the many uh, physical blessings that each one of us is blessed with, material blessings, and uh, the blessing of the measure of health that we have. We're thankful for the technology that brings us together. And, and Lord, we just want to be able to lift you up in all we say and do uh, today and in the week ahead. We know, Lord, that there are many uh, in our number and in our community who are struggling in different ways, there are folks dealing with sickness. Uh, there are folks who are enduring seasons of loss and grief, uh, isolation, loneliness. Uh, there are some of our students who are starting back to school and, and have mixed feelings about that. Some who are excited and looking forward to the year. Others who are already uh, dealing with disappointments about their classrooms or about their friends or about how life is changing around them. And, and we lift them up as well. Lord, we pray for those who are facing financial difficulties or problems in their marriages or with their extended family. Lord, help us as we go out into this week to be able to, 
to see the needs around us and to have grace and to have understanding as we deal with others. Help us to not be too quick uh, to judge people just by external things, but realize that there are there are stories and, and there are storms that are happening underneath that we can't see and, and can't always understand or appreciate. Lord, we'll be naming a few people here in a moment, specifically who are taking treatments or who are going through difficult seasons, and we ask especially that you would be with each one of them. We pray, Lord, for our country and for our community. We pray that uh, we would have grace for one another. Pray that we would look to see the good, um, as we talked about in our summers, uh, lessons to look for things that are good and praiseworthy and honorable. And um, Help us, Lord, not to be overwhelmed by the negativity around us. Help us to not uh, buy in uh, to those ideas, but instead realize that as long as you are active and alive in our world, uh, that there's hope and that as your children, we have uh, a reason to hope far beyond uh, what anyone else can expect or have. Lord, we ask that you also would uh, be with our missionary families today as we read some of their reports at our service. We pray for uh, those who are homeschooling their kids, those who are starting back to the school year uh, where they live, those who are dealing with uh, as uh, student ministries and youth ministries, uh, the new school year. Uh, just bless each one of these efforts for good. Um, bless us to be supportive of the things that we've pledged to support, not just financially, but with our prayers and with our um, our good deeds uh, throughout the week and throughout the remainder of this year. Lord, we pray for those who are serving, whether it's here as home, as law enforcement officers or first responders or social workers or counselors, we pray for those who are serving our country, um, especially with the volatile uh, situations that are all around the world. We lift them up and ask that they might serve in safety. As we go into this period of study today, Lord, we realize none of this would be possible without your son and his sacrifice. And we ask that you would, as we look at this text that talks about him and his reaction to others, uh, that you would help us to always have open hearts to his word and have open hearts to his message. Forgive us when we fall short of his example, when we fall short of what you've called us to as we seek to live for him and strengthen us in the days ahead. Lord, we love you and we're grateful for you. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Need just a little bit uh, of water this morning. Uh, as you know, there uh, it's a little bit dusty out and I've been dealing with that, but thankful uh, thankful to be here uh, with you. As I mentioned, we're going to be in Mark chapter 4 uh, today. So if you have your uh, physical Bible, it might be helpful uh, to have that out. It's not an extensive passage, uh, just a few verses, uh, but we're going to begin in Mark uh, 4 and verse 35 uh, in just a moment. We mentioned that we're talking about uh, kind of what the details of the questions that people ask, what they reveal about them. And last week we looked at Gideon. Uh, and his challenge uh, in Judges chapter 6 was, you know, the people of God were oppressed uh, politically, uh, they were in physical danger, and the angel of the Lord appears to him, and, and Gideon basically says, you know, if the Lord is really with us, why have all these things uh, happened to us? You know, uh, where is the God that we've heard about, the God of the miracles, the God of the Red Sea? Uh, our God seems to be absent. If we are really his people and he is truly our God, uh, where he, is he uh, in this situation? And of course, um, as you read that story and that develops, you see that the people have abandoned God. Uh, God had not abandoned them. They had turned aside to idols. In each generation, they had moved further away uh, from the Lord's ideal for them. And so they were uh, reaping not um, you know, the consequences of, of God just being cruel or vindictive. They were living in the reality of their own experience. Uh, they had continually moved away from God. Uh, they continually had ignored God, and so they had this distance between them. Uh, and it felt like abandonment, and it was, but it was abandonment in the other other direction. In that case, it was the people moving away uh, from God. And that makes people afraid. Um, people are afraid, uh, and so much of our fear as well as people comes from a perceived or a sensed lack of, of control. When we feel overwhelmed, like Gideon did uh, in our study last week, and you can go back and need, watch that video uh, if you need to, that recording, uh, if you weren't able to be with us last week. But when we when we feel overwhelmed, when we feel like nothing is making sense, our fear begins to drive us. It begins to motivate our actions rather than just being an emotion that's along for 
uh, the ride. Some of you may have recently seen Inside Out 2, uh, which is of course inside the head of a little girl, and it's her emotions, right? Her emotions are personified uh, in these characters. There's joy and sadness and envy and disgust and so forth. And uh, while that's probably not a, a perfect uh, picture of all of our mental state uh, or our psychiatric state, um, it is true that, that sometimes our emotions rise to the surface and drive us more than others. And fear is a terrible driver for us. It's good to have, uh, you know, fear to keep us safe, that kind of fight or flight uh, mechanism. Uh, but if it becomes the sole driver, it, uh, it confuses us and it, and it causes us to miss out uh, on the full range of our emotions. And so today, um, we're going to look at an example here in Mark chapter 4 of where they knew God was with them. Jesus is quite literally physically with them. And yet he doesn't seem to care. Um, he doesn't seem to respond to their need and the crisis that they are in. And that causes them uh, to be afraid. And that causes them to be frustrated. Uh, and we see that play out in this account. Mark chapter 4, uh, beginning with verse 35. Mark chapter 4, uh, beginning with verse 35. And I'm going to read down to the end of the chapter in verse 41. So just a few verses there. Now, Jesus has been healing, he's been teaching, the crowds are following him. And it says in verse 35, Mark chapter 4, On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. And now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And then they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be? that even the wind and the sea obey him. That question then coming uh, there in verse, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse uh, 38. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care? How can you sleep at a time like this? Do you not care? Is it no concern uh, to you what is happening uh, to us? Do you not care? I want to suggest to you today, as we as we talk together here for just a few moments, that fear, um, when it is driving us, okay, when it is uh, central, it blocks out all other emotions. Now, um, that is a good thing sometimes. If we are in a situation where we need to be afraid, um, where we are in a physical storm, for example, and we realize the light comes on, that we need to take shelter, that we need to, um, you know, get somewhere that is safer than where we currently are. Fear is a great motivator. It motivates us to move our feet. It motivates us to, to find a safer place. If we're in a situation with another person and we can see that they're angry, we can see that they're upset, uh, fear can motivate us to try to de-escalate the situation or to remove ourselves from the situation. It, it helps us to know that we uh, need to be aware and, and in a heightened sense of what's going on uh, in our surroundings. Fear is not a bad thing uh, in those situations. But when fear overwhelms judgment, common sense, um, the reality of the situation, when we're driven by our fear rather than uh, a balance of our emotions, and fear is driving us uh, even when the situation calls for trust or calls for faith or calls for uh, more of a critical approach or more of an intellectual approach. If we're driven by that emotion of fear and those responses of fear, uh, we miss out on things that are happening uh, around us. And so I want to look at that uh, here this morning, just looking at this passage, and we'll mention a couple of others uh, as well. First, I would suggest, what does fear make us do? Well, in this question they asked Jesus, do you care? You know, do you even care that, that this is happening to us? Uh, you know, why are you not responding to us? Uh, fear does some things to their thought process that I think it's helpful for us to look at. The first thing I would suggest is that fear makes us uh, forgetful. Fear makes us uh, forgetful. They had just witnessed uh, already in the Gospel of Mark, just in these few chapters that have already taken place, uh, four chapters at this point. They have witnessed miracles. They have heard great teaching. They've heard parables. Uh, they have seen Jesus heal. 
uh, they have seen Jesus. Um, if we read the parallel accounts uh, in the other Gospels, he's turned water to wine. Uh, he's going to be raising dead people back to life. Um, they have seen already, even early uh, in this ministry, the power of Jesus. They've seen him baptized. They've seen his ministry uh, begin. And yet in this moment, all of that is taken from their mind because of the immediate crisis, the immediate uh, calls, the storm uh, that is causing this fear in front of them. And so fear makes them forgetful. Um, did they forget who was in the boat? <laughs> did they forget that Jesus was in the boat with them? Uh, it makes it seem like, as Mark describes this, uh, if you look in verse 37, you know, the boat is already filling even in the worst storm, right? You could have seen the storm coming on, hopefully. Uh, we know we've, from previous study, there's a lot of sudden storms uh, on the Sea of Galilee that can be very violent uh, because of the geography that's there. But if the boat is already filling, then the rain has already started to fall. The wind has already started to pick up. And they have not, until the boat is filling, remembered that Jesus is in the boat with them. Um, they're trying to do it themselves. You know, they're trying to uh, assess the situation and respond to it uh, in their own strength. Fear has made them forget that they have the ultimate source of all power, of all calm, of all peace uh, in the boat with them. How long did they bail water, <laughs> you know, before they asked Jesus to wake up and to help them? Uh, I think that that's very telling because a lot of times in our lives, as we're dealing with situations, um, Fear or anxiety, as it may present itself, uh, it makes us forgetful. How long have we told at something? How long have we tried to work something out on our own uh, before we ever uh, submitted it to God in prayer, before we ever uh, brought it to the Lord, uh, before we ever uh, set aside some time to pray about it? Um, sometimes there'll be a big project that's coming up. Uh, and maybe it's in school or maybe in our workplace, and we will dread it, we will fret, we will overthink it. Um, we'll do the very opposite of what Philippians chapter 4 that we looked at in our summer uh, series was telling us, you know, to think uh, in a positive way, to think about the good, to think about the praiseworthy. We'll think about all the things that could go wrong, and we will forget, ultimately, uh, that there are people in our school, in our work, and ultimately spiritually, God is there uh, to help us, knows the situation, understands the situation, is willing to help in the situation, but we're not including him uh, in our plan. It makes us forgetful. Uh, fear makes us forget. Um, it clouds our judgment. Uh, we've all known people that could get excited, right? Maybe at an auction or a sale and they would lose all sense of judgment. They would forget their limits. Uh, they would forget what they said they were going to spend. They might even forget what they came to buy and get to bidding about something uh, on something else or some other product. And fear can do that too. It removes the rational from us. Um, we know that these men had been through uh, storms before. Uh, we know that they've been through difficult storms before. Um, at least four of them, if not more, uh, were professional boatmen, professional fishermen on the Sea of Galilee before they followed, before they followed Jesus. Uh, and yet, all that training, all that thinking in a moment of fear uh, goes out the window. Maybe you've witnessed an, an accident uh, in your life, maybe a car accident, or you've seen someone have a fall. And we'll talk about, right, how adrenaline takes over. Or maybe um, we've been in a situation where we were um, in a place that felt unsafe and, and our fear heightened our senses, but it also made us unaware. It made us forgetful. Maybe we're worried about walking to our car in the dark, but because we're fearful, uh, yes, our senses are heightened, maybe for good reason, but it also makes us forget where we parked. It disorients us, and that's what happens uh, here. Um, fear offers us kind of this dangerous sense of self-reliance. They were looking for their solution, um, and they forgot that ultimately the source of all uh, strength and peace and calm uh, was right there in the boat with them. In this situation for them, uh, God has become, uh, the, pre the physical presence of Jesus has become uh, a last resort. Sometimes we do that as well, right? Um, we think of prayer 
or we think of being at worship, or we think of reaching out to a brother or sister in Christ for help as a last resort. Um, when Paul writes to the church at Corinth and he's talking about marriage and talking about some of the things that are happening in the church there, he uses a phrase and he's using is about uh, maybe persecution or something that's happening at that moment. And he talks about the present distress. Um, we've looked, of course, at First Thessalonians before where God's people were dealing with, with pressure and so they've kind of tuned out things and are, are focusing on the second coming um, and not attending to their surroundings. And I think sometimes the present distress, right, the current fear uh, causes us to be forgetful. We've obviously seen so much in the last few weeks and months about the presidential election uh, and about, um, you know, changes happening in our country. And people look at that and they're very afraid. Uh, they're afraid of change, um, but also some people are afraid of things staying the same and us missing an opportunity to make a change. Uh, and that can go, of course, in either direction. Some, there's fear on one side of what will happen if one person wins or if one person loses and vice versa. Sometimes as Christians, we can get caught up in looking at the present crisis so much that we forget the presence of God. We forget that God reigns over all, that God rules over all. That's true, of course, in the world and in our, in our country, but that's true of us personally. How many times have we been anxious, fearful, upset, and not thought to appeal to God, or at least not thought to appeal to Him until it became almost a last resort, a last ditch uh, effort, so to speak? Sometimes we'll use the expression, and I try not to use it, uh, but I hear people use it, and I've maybe used it, I know I have myself at times, where someone will say, well, what can I do for you? Is there anything we can do to help? And someone will say, well, all we can do is pray about it. Um, we mean that in the sense of maybe there's not anything physical, right? We don't need a meal or we don't need a ride to the doctor. Or we don't need uh, someone to come over and counsel us and we, and we want them to pray. But we say it almost dismissively. Well, all we can do is pray about it as if prayer is the last thing um, that we can do. If we can't do anything else, we ought to pray. And that's what fear does to us. That's what anxiety does to us. It pushes God's presence out of the picture. It did that for Gideon as he threshed in the wine press, and it does that for the disciples here. Um, they're not thinking about what the Lord can do initially. They're only thinking about the Lord um, when they get desperate, when they get to the end of their rope. Notice also, though, uh, in that same context here in, in Mark 4, that it doesn't just make them fearful. Uh, it makes them foolish. Fear makes them foolish. Um, you know, this question is insulting, really, of Jesus. Um, you know, Lord, do you not care? You know, do you not care that we're perishing? You've fed the crowds. You've healed the sick. Uh, at this point, you've, you've done these miracles. You're preaching salvation. Uh, and you don't even care about us, your closest friends. Again, this is the fear talking, right? This is not their reason. This is not what they've witnessed. This is not like a careful analysis of the character of Jesus. Um, this is their fear causing them to say something that is ultimately very foolish. It's not accurate. Uh, it's not faithful to what they know to be true. Their fear is motivating what is being said, uh, not the reality of what they know. Has the Lord ever been uncaring, you know, towards them? Um, is there a situation where they ever had a true need that they had asked the Lord for and he had withheld it or withheld something better uh, from them? No. Um, we know that, right, from the text, but we know that about ourselves as well. Uh, I think this question, it's a very sincere question, but it's misguided. Uh, it's foolish. It's not considering the facts. And the reason that it's not considering the facts is because it's coming out of this deep place of uncertainty, this deep place of anxiety, this deep place of fear, rather than a place uh, of faith and rather than a place uh, of trust. Um, it, had he ever failed to do what was right? Uh, to do what was best? Uh, was he was he like a 50-50 person? Uh, I don't think Jesus was the person, whether he was a carpenter or whether involved in his earthly ministry or whether his parents sent him to the store for something, um, that when he was asked to do what was right and good, that he ever failed to do it. Uh, we know he was without sin. Uh, we know he sometimes responded in unconventional ways, uh, certainly, um, but he always does what is right. He always ultimately... Um, fulfills the faith that's been placed in him, but they are leaning into their fear, leaning into their anxiety in the heat of the moment, 
uh, that they're experiencing, this foolish question rises to the top. We think about John 11 and the conversation that Jesus has as he waits and, and Lazarus does pass away uh, even after word has come. And, uh, you know, Mary and Martha both repeat the question of Jesus or the statement, really, uh, of their faith, but it's tinged with, uh, with misunderstanding. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not uh, have died. Um, they know, right, what the Lord could have done, and yet they don't understand. Uh, they're fearful, they're anxious, they're confused, and so it leads them to, um, you know, to, to, to wonder if the Lord really cares. Uh, you know, if you really cared, Lord, why were you not here? Uh, intellectually, they know that Jesus cares about them, but they don't feel cared for. Um, I think about in Job uh, chapter 1 and 2, where the, uh, the things that are happening to Job are described. And uh, if you're familiar with the story of Job, we won't take time to, to flesh out the whole thing. Um, but if you're familiar with that, that account, you know that Job is a very righteous man. And he's a very blessed man. And uh, there's this kind of cosmic conversation between Satan and God about Job fearing God for nothing. You know, if, if something bad happened to him, he wouldn't fear the Lord. And so the Lord allows Satan to test Job and to try him uh, with his physical health and with his family and with his possessions. And ultimately, um, Job's wife, uh, in her grief and her anxiety and her um, her just overwhelming sorrow, no doubt, about what has happened. Uh, she says in uh, Job chapter 2, uh, beginning with verse, uh, verse 8, uh, this is talking about Job. It says, uh, he took for himself a potsherd. Uh, this is when he's broken out in these terrible bulls. And he began to scrape himself as he sat in ashes. And his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But Job said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speak. Shall indeed we accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? And in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. He uses the analogy, or he uses the description of his wife um, as she's speaking as a foolish woman. Honestly, she's speaking just how I would have spoken, uh, and probably just how many of you would have spoken. She's seen her wealth taken, her children have died, her husband has been afflicted with this terrible illness, and she says, what are you doing? You know, why are you still holding fast uh, to this faith in God? It has not been rewarded. Um, it's been taken. God has allowed all of these terrible things to happen. Wouldn't it be better just to die than to have to endure any more of this? Now, in her grief and her sorrow and her anxiety, um, it's all being overwhelmed, right? All of her uh, faith, all of her goodness, all of her... Um, you know, sense of perspective, all that's being overwhelmed. That is a perfectly human response. It's not a faithful response. It's a fear-based response. It's a grief-based response, but it is completely understandable. Fear and grief, and I think we see this just in those few verses in Job, they either drive a wedge between us and God. Do you not care? You know, does God not care what's happening to me? You know, where is the God that brought out our forefathers? Where is the God that blessed our church? Where is the God that provided for our family? Where is this God? Uh, and if we still believe that God is there, why has he not done something? Does he not care about what's happening to me? Did God not say that if I was faithful, he would be faithful? Where is God? These are the questions that arise when fear enters the picture. Fear either drives us away from God in those questions. It drives us toward doubt. It drives us toward despair. It drives us toward greater anxiety. Or in Job's case, it drives us to God. Um, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be uh, the name of the Lord, as Job chapter 1 closes. And so we have to think about, you know, fear makes us forget that God is with us, uh, as the disciples do. You know, it's like they, oh, we haven't even thought that Jesus is here, uh, even though they had already seen miracles and witnessed his power. But it also makes us uh, foolish. Uh, it makes us an experience of a moment, the fear of the moment, can make us doubt a God who has always uh, been faithful. Uh, I think about, uh, too, it makes us ignorant of the facts. Uh, we looked at Judges last week with Gideon in the story of Samson, which is told later uh, in Judges chapter 13. Uh, Manoah and his wife have a conversation uh, with the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord receives their worship. Um, the angel here is a theophany. You know, it's, a, it's a manifestation of God himself. 
the angel gives them all these details. The presence of the Lord gives them all these details about how to raise the child. And then Manoah says, well, we're going to die because we've seen God face to face. And his wife, thankful for godly women, she says, if the Lord was going to kill us, Manoah, he wouldn't have given us all these details about how to raise the baby that hasn't been born yet. Um, and I think, you know, that's that's almost comical, right? But Manoah, he gets all these instructions and then it realizes, oh no, I mean, I've, I've violated the word. I've, I've seen the Lord. Uh, what's going to happen to us now? And she very logically and very much in faith says, he would not have told us what to do if he wasn't going to keep us alive uh, to do it. In his fear of having witnessed God, uh, a fear that in some cases is very legitimate, uh, he loses a sense of perspective about what God has called him to do, he and his wife. Doesn't that happen to us? You know, we, we see what God has asked us of us. We see what God says in his word. We see an opportunity. And we know that in faith we're supposed to be living in a certain way or doing a certain thing. And yet we allow our fear to make us foolish. I don't, I don't want to do this. This burden seems too heavy. Uh, how will this work out? Um, again, we're, we're back in the wine press mentality um, from Gideon's experience. Um, and if we allow that anxiety to overwhelm us, we can allow that fear to make us forget who God is and make us foolish in how we respond to him. So what's the solution? Um, ultimately, if it makes us forgetful, it makes us, um, it makes us foolish in how we act. Unchecked fear can lead to our faithlessness. Um, if we allow, uh, as we see the disciples careening towards, um, to allow fear that is unchecked and unrestrained uh, to take full rule in our lives, it leads us to faithfulness. It leads us to doubt God's presence. It leads us to doubt God's goodness. And it leaves us in a place where our faith is dry, uh, if not altogether, altogether dead. The disciples in this storm, they could not control their circumstances and because they could not control the storm, and because they lost sight of where Jesus was, uh, they lost sight of their faith. The object of their faith was right there with them. But their eyes were so distracted and so lifted up into the storm that their faith was shaken. God is with us, right? Emmanuel. Jesus came and lived among us. God is with us in his word, as we've read today. God is with us in his spirit and in his providence and in his presence. Um, and yet, if we lose sight of those things... If we forget them or we allow them to make us foolish, uh, our faith ultimately suffers. When life is moving at the expected speed, uh, when things are happening as they should in the order that they should, we have a tendency to put things on cruise control. Um, Amory and I traded cars uh, yesterday and uh, been needing to do that, needing something a little bit more reliable. I had a great run with my little car uh, that I've loved for years, um, but almost 200,000 miles, it was time to upgrade. And one of the things on a package, right, as you're looking at a vehicle, is they'll talk about the features. And one of those, of course, on many uh, modern vehicles is cruise control. You know, if you're on the interstate, you can push that button and have the right speed. And as long as nothing gets in front of you, and as long as you don't have to slow down for traffic, uh, you don't have to keep your foot on the gas. You can just cruise uh, right on. And the, and the computer in the car knows, it senses um, that, that you've placed it on a cruise control and it adjusts accordingly. It'll go up and down based on what's happening uh, in front of you. You can disengage. What I think is, is telling about our faith is that I, that happens too. Um, you know, when things are going fine, when things are going smooth, nothing big is happening. There's nothing to really thank God for. Uh, as far as big things that are happening. There's nothing to be depressed about or anxious about or fearful about. In a low sense, we can just be cruising. Uh, these disciples have been on the Sea of Galilee thousands of times, uh, and they apparently had lost sight of the fact it could be dangerous. And because they had kind of gone on cruise control in their mind, they had also gone on cruise control uh, in their faith. <clears throat> they expected that because Jesus was with them, everything would be smooth. Do you not care? Why have you not fixed this? We're good disciples. We're doing what's right. Why are we still having trouble, Jesus? Why are there still storms in our lives? We do the same, right? Uh, I'm living right. I'm trying to live right. I'm trying to do the best I can. And yet things keep coming up. Um, people still get sick. Surgeries still go badly. There's still accidents. There's still uh, grief. There's still divorce. There's still the trials of life that come. And we can become very, very frustrated when we forget that life is not 
promise to be a pleasure cruise. Um, you know, the, the, the life of faith is not something that we start it and it goes completely smooth the whole way to the end. Uh, there's going to be times of difficulty. There's going to be storms uh, that come up. When life is smooth, we don't think we need Jesus. Now, we wouldn't say that. Uh, we're glad to have him with us, but we're not checking in with him. We're not using his power. We're not appealing to him with our needs because we can handle things uh, ourselves. But when the storm comes and the fear rises, sometimes it takes us a minute to remember that he's with us, to remember that, that he wants to help us, that it's not foolish to request his help, that our faith is built not in the cruise. Our faith is not built on smooth uh, ground. If we were preparing uh, to be sailors, to be uh, people that were working on ships, anybody can carry a, you know, I have a friend that's working on a cruise ship right now uh, doing entertainment. Anyone can, can do that, right? When it's smooth, uh, when it's just like being on dry land, when there's no uh, rock to the boat, when there's no waves on the sea, when there's no storm, uh, any one of, of, of an average uh, health, uh, spiritually speaking, can live fine in those conditions or at least can convince themselves that they can. But when things begin to rock, when things begin to storm, we need to realize that we need the Lord and that he's with us. We come to do that. I hope that as we look at this, we see how quickly Jesus responds. The storm arose, their anxiety arose, and then he arose when they woke him up and he said, peace be still. And the text that uses the same idea, it went from a great storm to a great calm. And they were so amazed by how that happened that the calm made them more afraid of him and his power than the storm had done. Jesus, as believers, is with us. The question is, are we with him? Are we paying attention to him? Are we nurturing our relationship with him? Or we, have we become forgetful? Have we become uh, people that foolishly think that we're fine as we are, that, it, that, that we have everything under control? Uh, Jesus is over there. I've got, I've got him in my corner. If I need him for something, I'll wake him up, but I'm doing just fine. Um, ooh, what a dangerous way to think and yet a way that we're all tempted to think from day to day. When we forget about Jesus, it makes us foolish. And when we are foolish and forgetful, our faith suffers. We need to recognize that we need to wake Jesus up. Actually, we may not need to let him go to sleep, so to speak, in our hearts, but to keep our faith constantly uh, in front of our hearts, in front of our minds, growing into it, living into it from day to day. Jesus doesn't sleep because he doesn't care. Jesus is not asleep in that boat because he doesn't care about them. He is asleep in the storm because he has spent his day ministering to others. Uh, and he has spent his day focused on his Father. He has spent his day confident of God's presence with him. And so he can rest uh, in that. He sets an example for us that if we are connected with God, if we are connected with God through Christ, if Christ is in us and we are in him, we can have confidence and calm and peace in the storm. We don't need to let fear drive the boat. We don't need to let fear dominate our lives. That's easier said than done. But when we recognize that God is with us and that he does care so much for us, each one of us, in whatever we are facing, when we recognize that, when we remember it, what does the, what does the thief on the cross say? Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's a great prayer. Um, I think today, as we begin a new week and, and this new season with the school year and the fall ahead, Lord willing, we need to remember um, that Jesus cares for us and we need to care enough to involve him in our lives actively, not just his presence somewhere back in the background if we need him like a spare tire, but to involve him in each and every part of our lives. It'll help us to remember his presence It'll help us to respond in faith rather than with, with foolishness. And ultimately, it will calm um, the storms, the challenges, the difficulties that come in our lives. Sometimes the storm doesn't go away immediately. But we can experience the great calm that comes when we wake Jesus up and we, re we realize just how much he cares for us.
I just love that account. That was one of the first uh, many years ago from that passage, different lesson uh, from that passage, but one of the first uh, lessons I preached at Lebanon uh, came from Mark chapter 4, and that text just gets richer, I believe, uh, I believe with time. If you have your communion supplies, go ahead and be taking those out, and uh, I'll offer a couple of prayers here, uh, first for the bread and then for the cup. Uh, as I say each week, uh, feel free to, uh, if you're there with others, turn me off. Um, having received the lesson and, and be blessed with it or uh, mute the video if you want to uh, during this Lord's Supper time and offer your prayers, uh, pray together, uh, read together from uh, maybe 1 Corinthians 11 uh, or one of the passion narratives in the Gospels, sing a hymn together, uh, all those things to prepare uh, your mind. Uh, and then we'll meet you on the other side with the announcements if you want to stay tuned uh, for those. If you're praying along with us and taking the Lord's Supper, uh, I'll pray first for the bread. Uh, and then pause for a moment and pray for the cup uh, before we enter into our uh, announcements together. Let's pray. Let's pray for the bread together. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful again for this day. Thankful that you give us this memorial, this feast, um, this time of remembrance. Lord, help us to remember what Jesus did for us. Help us to remember that he's always with us. And as we take this bread, help us to remember that he was physically in a body that lived upon this earth that suffered for us, um, suffered in the flesh just as we suffer, and even more so. And help us to take this bread in remembrance of that suffering and in remembrance of the love that allowed that suffering to take place. It's in his name we pray. And let's pray also for the cup at this time. Lord, again, we're grateful for the ability to remember, to remember that Christ is with us. He's with us in our fellowship as a church. He's with us in your word. And he's with us here as we remember his death. Lord, we're thankful for this cup, the fruit of the vine, which reminds us of the blood that was shed. And we ask that we would examine our own lives and see the places where our faith needs to grow. Uh, that we would see the places where Christ is present with us each and every day, and that in taking this, we would not only remember what he's done for us already, but that we would proclaim his death until he comes again. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, again, it's good to uh, see you uh, this morning and have the opportunity to be here. Uh, got some uh, early early start this morning, uh, and I hope that you're able to to enjoy uh, this Lord's Day uh, to rest, to recover if you're dealing with sickness. Uh, and um, I'm just grateful to be able to share this time with you. I do have a few announcements uh, I want to mention, particularly for the benefit of our our local folks. Uh, if you have your offering, if you're part of our local church uh, at Lebanon uh, and have that and need to get that to us, just reach out to us and let us know and we'll make arrangements to do that if you're not able to be with us for the next few weeks uh, or dealing with treatments or whatever the case uh, may be and want to be able to share in that. As far as birthdays go, uh, today, Sunday, the 11th, uh, is Ricky Dunlap's birthday. Thankful for Ricky and Dolores and all they mean to our uh, church family and uh, thankful for Ricky and and uh, hope he gets to be outside today. It's a beautiful day uh, and he loves to uh, work there at the farm and I uh, hope he's able to do that after worship today. Um, as far as updates and things happening with our congregation, uh, we celebrate with Maggie Robinson and her family. Maggie was uh, baptized into Christ last Sunday. Uh, you may have seen uh, our posts about that uh, this week and we're thankful for Maggie, uh, thankful for that class uh, with our young ladies uh, that has uh, been such a great influence. Thankful for uh, Paige and Anne-Marie and Brittany and others who have uh, taught and influenced those girls and, of course, their parents as well. Uh, but thankful for Maggie and that decision and uh, praying for her as she begins her, her walk with Christ. Also, thank you for those who uh, made us aware of the school supply needs uh, and helped in that drive uh, that we were able to help with at the schools in Gleason and uh, Dresden as well. And uh, just thankful that we were able to help in that. You may have seen 
uh, where the school shared about that online and, and grateful for that opportunity there. Uh, go ahead and be marking your calendar uh, for Thursday, October 10th. That'll be the night where we will be uh, over at the Church of Christ Student Center, the Skyhawks for Christ uh, campus ministry at University of Tennessee at Martin. And uh, that we'll be hosting that night, but we'll be at their facility. Uh, and uh, Blake and his crew will be helping us with the food. But we love having our members there. Uh, a lot of our kids, uh, middle school, high school age, they will be going to UTM uh, just geographically. That tends to take place for us. And so that's a great way to introduce them to students, to the campus ministry, uh, and to be able to share that with them. Uh, so it's good for the campus ministry. It's good for us and our church as well. So mark down October 10th uh, for that, and we'll be looking forward to that. Also, Magi boxes, the empty boxes have arrived uh, there at the building. And so if you need one of those, uh, a couple of those, and a packing list, uh, if you need those from the building uh, and can't get there today, uh, there'll be some there over the next few weeks, and we'll try to get that finished up around the 1st of September. Uh, the list is there. The box is there. The church will pay the shipping. Um, but if you have um, a desire to do that and help with that ministry uh, for Healing Hands International, uh, please, uh, please be aware that those boxes and packing lists are ready. We also have several new updates. Uh, we mentioned our missionary families in prayer. Uh, several new updates that are posted at the building. Also have those in email. Uh, if you need them, that's how we usually do that now rather than the, the thick packets that we used to do. Uh, they'll send us an email. We can print those out uh, as many copies as we need. So if you don't have time, uh, maybe today, to look at those at the building, if there's a particular work you're interested in uh, that we support, um, just feel free to, to maybe glance at the board, see what's out there, and you can learn more about that with a packet or with a, um, a printout of the PDF of their newsletter. Just ask me for which ones you want or need, have an interest in, uh, and we'll get those to you. As far as our uh, health and trials go, people that are dealing with different things, I want to continue to remember Lee Gwynn, who's still in the hospital, uh, and the placement for him. Uh, Lee, of course, uh, all his life has been dealing with some pretty severe health challenges. And, um, and of course, Judith, uh, his mother worshiping there with us. Uh, and uh, we just want to continue to remember Lee as he's in the hospital and as we try to figure uh, out a plan for him and just bless their family uh, in this time. Uh, Carolyn McIntyre had a, um, a scare this past week with a retina tear uh, and had that first part of this past week. I was able to have a couple of procedures and is much improved and hoping to be at worship in person uh, today. So we're very thankful uh, for that. Appreciate those who reached out to her, reached out to uh, Lanny, also reached out to me. We were kind of keeping each other in the loop with that uh, and checking on them. So appreciate that uh, and want to continue to, to pray for Carolyn and her recovery. I want to continue to pray for Gail Barker as she's dealing with some issues with her health. I want to remember Randy English uh, who had been and had his uh, PET scan and is dealing uh, with some uh, just ongoing health challenges. So remember uh, Randy and Pam this week. Uh, Burnell McLean got a good report from her cardi cardiologist and is continuing uh, her cancer treatment. Uh, she'll be going back and forth every few weeks to Vanderbilt. And so we want to continue to remember her. Uh, please remember Jimmy Mayo. Uh, that's Judas' brother out in Texas who's dealing with cancer uh, and, and uh, has had some setbacks, had been in remission and now uh, is uh, cancer has returned. It's not going to take uh, further treatment with his age and other health problems. And so I uh, remember him. Remember Ann Ralston, uh, Joyce Todd's daughter, who's also in Texas and taking cancer treatment. I uh, continue to remember Greta Hughes, uh, Jennifer Mayo Blackstone, uh, Casey Hughes, that's Ronell's uh, older brother who watches with us each week. And uh, we're thankful that Casey uh, is able to be with us online and, and appreciate that. Please remember Roberta Parker, uh, who is Andrea's mother, who's uh, still facing uh, just some ongoing long-term health issues. Uh, Kim Chadwell, I uh, want to remember her as well. Uh, Jerry Del Monroe, who is uh, related to several of us uh, in the congregation uh, physically, and our brother in Christ, he's one of the elders over at Greenfield. He's been back in the hospital, and uh, Jerry Dale deals with a lot of chronic health issues, and so I want to continue to remember him. also want to remember Vicki Whitworth, uh, Betsy Robinson's friend who's taking cancer treatments, also Miss Faye Robinson, uh, Brenda K. Burris, who's Greta Hughes' sister. I want to remember uh, Brenda K. Uh, as well. And I uh, want to remember Ray Burris, that's Greta's uh, nephew. Uh, there's a lot of people, obviously, in our community uh, dealing with other sicknesses and treatments. Uh, Larry uh, Irwin, who's been worshiping with us, is uh, dealing with some health challenges right now. I want to remember he and Jennifer this week. 
um, we just have a lot of folks dealing with a lot of things, and that's basically uh, the way it is in this life. And rather than be overwhelmed by anxiety and fear by that, uh, we want to, as much as possible as, as we can, uh, focus faithfully on what the Lord has done and what the Lord is doing uh, and trust Him in those things. Um, with school uh, starting back up, there will be a lot of sickness. Uh, that seems pretty much inevitable. So we all gather back in together uh, for school and ball games and the like. Obviously, if you've been paying attention, our COVID numbers are up uh, in our community. And so encourage everyone to uh, do what they can in that area uh, and want to remember those who may be dealing with that or being exposed uh, now being back in the school in the school setting. Uh, we obviously want to continue to pray for our country and our world, uh, the various conflicts that are taking place. <clears throat> as, excuse me, <clears throat> and the upcoming, uh, of course, uh, elections as well. Uh, pray for unity uh, in our fellowship as well, uh, as many people have very strong opinions and we don't all have the same uh, ones. And so we want to continue to to pray in our divided time uh, for that. I'm sure there are others um, that need to be mentioned that may have been mentioned that I just don't have on my list in front of me. If you'll make me aware of those, uh, I'll try to uh, offer those up uh, as we have the opportunity. I do want to say, uh, for those of you who may be watching who uh, are in our area and may be thinking about worshiping with us uh, in person soon, as I mentioned, we have Bible classes at 9 o'clock on Sundays for all ages. We're doing kind of a refresh uh, with that, and so uh, we're working right now on curriculum and in our classrooms, and hopefully um, going into September, uh, Lord willing, in a couple of weeks, we'll be able to uh, kind of launch that. It would be a great time if you've just been tuning in online with us and that's what you've been able to do uh, in the season that you've been in. Uh, this would be a great time to start a practice of worshiping in person on Sunday, if that's possible uh, for you, and include in that uh, Sunday school. It's a great time to look at scripture. Uh, we have classes for little bitty, um, you know, toddlers, uh, all the way up to, to the oldest of us. Uh, be a great opportunity to re-engage uh, with in-person worship and Bible class. Uh, if you're in our area. If anyone needs to be added uh, to our list or a need that needs to be added to our list, uh, just let us know. I want to continue to pray for our students uh, in this first full week of school that's coming up for them. I uh, want to remember them, uh, our students and teachers, parents and families uh, as well. Um, there were several events that have happened in the last week. As always, make us aware of those and we'll try to share them, try to share them here. Thankful uh, that you've been able to be here today. Thankful that we have a God who cares and who is with us and who wants to save us, who longs for us to tune into his strength and to tune into his power. He's not going to force himself on us, but he's present with us. He cares for us, and uh, we need to remember that and to not allow fear uh, to drive us, but instead be driven uh, and held close by our faith. Let's pray together, and uh, we'll go out and face the week. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, we're thankful for this day, thankful for all that you are and all that you do for us. Help us to realize that you care, that you are near, and that you long for us to bring our cares to you and to entrust them to you. You long to bring that calm, that peace to our lives um, outwardly, but especially inwardly. Um, help us to realize that no matter what our outward circumstances are, uh, you are with us and you care. Be with us and go th with us through our services today in person. Be with us through the week ahead. Watch over us and hold us close. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hope everyone has a great week and Lord willing, we'll see you soon. If you're in our area and are able, uh, 9, 10, and 5 today on Lebanon Church Road. Have a great week. Bye-bye.